Hello everyone, this is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. And this will be an installment for patrons of the History of the United States in 100 Objects. And today will be object number 20, Silver Beaker with Devil and Pope Figures. So firstly, just to describe basically what is this object. It's a round silver beaker or small drinking glass about three inches tall. The beaker itself was made in France around 1740, and it was engraved with elaborate patterns and decorations in New York in 1750. And it's decorated with anti-Catholic verses and a depiction of a so-called Pope's Day procession, and it is today held in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York. So what is so important or meaningful about this object? Well, the thing itself is a fairly ordinary, if well-made, small drinking vessel. What makes it remarkable is the engraved designs, which wrap a full 360 degrees around the sides of the cup. And along the top, near the rim, there are doggerel verses, and below those, an elaborate scene with three figures being led by ropes into a dragon's mouth. So first, just to describe these engravings that are seen on the beaker, which make it so distinctive. We'll say we work our way around the sides of the cup from right to left in the direction of the motion of this mock procession. Firstly, we see a figure of a man in chainmail armor and carrying a sword. And this figure presumably represents Charles Edward Stuart, the scion of the deposed Catholic Stuart dynasty, which laid claim to the British throne from exile. His supporters at this time sometimes called him Bonnie Prince Charlie, since they considered him to be the legitimate Prince of Wales. And he was Bonnie, that's a usually Scottish term meaning attractive, gallant, chivalrous. But his enemies, including those who engraved this beaker, more often called him the young pretender. Pretender meaning claimant or false claimant. And he was the young pretender in contrast to his father, the so-called James III, the old pretender, and who claimed to be the legitimate king of Great Britain. So we see this figure, Bonnie Prince Charlie, or the young pretender, engraved on the beaker with his hands folded in front of him in prayer, but with a rope fastened around his neck, which seems to be pulling him forward. And if we follow this rope, we see that it passes through a gallows with the crossbeam labeled danger. And then past the gallows, it leads to another figure, the second figure, a bearded man in bishop's robes and mitre and holding a cross, which presumably represents the Pope. And so this part of the design implies, you could say, that the pretender Prince Charles is being led onward by the Pope. There's this sense of conspiracy, of being a sort of puppet on a string. So he's being led on by the Pope in his attempts to reclaim the British crown. And the Pope, too, the rope wraps around his neck as well, and then continues forward and passes under an arched gateway with a skull, and on top of the gateway, it is inscribed with the word death. And through this gate, it then continues forward to a third figure. And that third figure is a naked man carrying a whip. And his body is entwined with a large serpent. And presumably, this figure represents Satan. And hence, by implication, Satan is leading onward both the Pope and the Pretender in their machinations to try to recapture the British throne. And then finally, at the end of the design, the devil figure is seen marching straight into the mouth of a dragon that is rising out of the earth, spewing flames. And the flames are conveniently labeled hell, right? just to make it totally clear what this represents. And so in sum, what we see is three figures all roped together, marching inexorably forward through danger and death to damnation. Now, as I said, along the rim of the cup, there are three couplets of doggerel verse. And these read, quote, Three mortal enemies remember, the devil, pope, and the pretender. Most wicked, damnable, and evil, the pope, pretender, and the devil. I wish they were all hanged in a rope 
the pretender, devil, and the pope. So notice in this rhyme, we have this repetition of threes, right? There are three couplets of verse. Each one refers to these three evil, damnable figures. And they seem to form, you could say, a sort of evil or sinister reflection of the Trinity. And in fact, the, the last phrase, which says, quote, the pretender, devil, and the pope, pretty closely echoes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It almost rhymes. And this cup with its engravings may have been meant for display. They could have been put on a mantle or a corner cupboard and possibly as a conversation piece, something to point out, to observe, to pass around and talk about. And it may have been used also for occasional special occasions, such as toasting, specifically on November 5th, which is an important day that in the 1700s was called Pope's Day. You may have heard of it in more recent times as Guy Fawkes Day, which was an extremely important date in the colonial British calendar. And moreover, this theme of Trinity, of a sort of uh, repetition and concatenation of threes upon threes, this theme seems to continue even beyond this particular vessel itself. And as I'll explain later, it seems as if this piece was probably conceived as part of a set of three. But in order to determine this and to reconstruct the set and what it represents, we have to consider its provenance, who created and possessed this vessel. So if one turns the beaker upside down and looks on the underside, one sees a silversmith's mark and an engraved signature. So to begin with the mark of the silversmith who made this cup originally, it's the mark of a French silversmith named Hugues Lossier, who in the early and mid 1700s was based in the town of Saint-Malo in Brittany in France. So most likely this beaker was originally made in France. And Uglossier stemmed from a very prominent family of silversmiths who supplied valuable wares to noble families in Brittany. And Ugg's father and grandfather actually both had seigneurial titles. His grandfather had been known as Uglossier de la Vallée. So he had that nominative de showing that he, was, he had a title. And Uglossier the Younger, who made this beaker, did not have a title like that, so maybe he didn't have quite the same level of attainment, but he probably still had a great deal of status and prestige in French society by association, by coming from this exceptionally celebrated and honored family of craftsmen. Now, we don't know how did this fairly small and simple beaker, really in the plain style of the mid-1700s, we don't know how it then got to New York. But it is possible that it might have been intentionally commissioned by the engraver who then added the engraving decorations on it. So alongside the silversmith's maker's mark on the bottom of the beaker, there is an engraved signature, Joseph Liddell, 1750. So who is Joseph Liddell? He was an engraver working in New York in the mid-1700s who also came from a long-standing family of craftsmen. And this was common, that highly skilled crafts would often be taught and passed down from father to son in a family. So he was living and working in New York in the mid-1700s. His father was a pewter smith. And the two of them, it seems, sometimes collaborated on projects. For example, in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, there is a fine, round, pewter-lidded box made by Joseph Liddell the Elder, and the decorative engraved bands on it were engraved by Joseph Liddell the Younger. So they probably worked together sometimes, maybe in the same workshop. Now, Joseph Liddell the Elder's father, so our engraver's grandfather, had migrated from France to New York in the late 1600s. And it seems that he was part of the large wave of French Reformed Protestants, also called Huguenots, who fled from France after 1685. And you may know that was the year in which King Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes and renewed persecution of Protestants in France. 
So there was a massive emigration of Huguenots out of France from 1685 through the early 1700s. And many of these went to Great Britain, which was still a you know, predominantly Protestant nation, and some also went to the British colonies, and especially a lot of them went to New York, which was a fast-growing town, a multi-ethnic, multilingual town, and it was one where the Dutch Reformed Church was large and prominent, and the teachings and practices of the Dutch Reformed Church were more or less Calvinist, and so they fit fairly closely with the religious beliefs and sensibilities of most of these Huguenot emigrants and refugees. And so it was a natural place for French Huguenots to go, and many of them just quickly joined the Dutch Reformed Church there. So hence, New York, by 1750, the year when this cup was engraved, by that time, New York had a great wealth of skilled craftsmen of Huguenot origins. So Protestantism was popular among the mercantile class, some of the nobility, and a lot of the artisanal class of skilled craftsmen. So a lot of these skilled craftsmen from France went to New York to serve those markets, and there was a great abundance of skilled furniture makers, metal workers, and other highly valued craftsmen who were descended from or trained by French Huguenot emigrants. That was a big element of New York society. Now, as for the political convictions of these colonists in New York in the mid-1700s, they tended by this time to be strongly royalist and fiercely anti-Catholic. And they hadn't always been so strongly royalist. There was a lot of controversy. You might remember there was a civil war in the mid-1600s in which the king was overthrown and executed. But by the mid-1700s, a sort of firmly royalist ideology had been cemented where people looked to the British throne as the great bulwark protecting Protestantism against the Catholic enemies. And the major towns of the colonies, especially New York and Boston, were sites of so-called Pope's Day revelries held on November 5th, which is the anniversary of the so-called gunpowder plot in which some radical Catholics who had gone into exile on the continent and then returned to England plotted to blow up the House of Parliament and kill the king and most of the British government or the English government in 1605 and which was just narrowly thwarted the night before it was to be carried out. So since that time, people had observed this anniversary, and it had started off as a sort of solemn occasion of commemoration. But in the 1700s, it really became a time of revelry and celebration of the display of Protestant loyalties and hatred and antipathy towards the Catholic menace, and particularly in the colonies. This was a sort of defining annual event, and it involved often elaborate processions of costumed figures, which would then be followed by hanging and burning effigies of these hated figures, including, of course, Guy Fox, often the Pope. So while those were sort of common figures early on, uh, the, the Pope, uh, Guy Fox, and then the Devil, it seems that by 1750, the focus had shifted even more onto the deposed Catholic Stuart dynasty and their so-called pretenders. So this beaker was made in 1750, which was really in the wake of the 1745 uprising, a major attempt by the Stuarts to rally their supporters and overthrow the Hanovers and retake the throne. And this uprising had been led mainly by Bonnie Prince Charlie, right, the so-called Prince of Wales, Charles Edward Stuart, and it had come reasonably close to succeeding. Right? They had taken possession of most of Scotland, marched south into England, gone as far as Derby in the middle of England before turning back. And this beaker you could take as one piece of evidence that people were very much aware and had strong feelings about this Stuart Jacobite threat, and that the figures or effigies of Bonnie Prince Charlie by that time had been integrated into the Pope's Day processions. 
So the engravings that we see on this beaker may be based on real processions, and furthermore, the doggerel verses that we see around the rim might possibly have been verses that were actually chanted or sung in these grand processions, or they may have been recited as part of toasts in the home, or both. Nonetheless, the fact that Liddell, this New York engraver of Huguenot ancestry, the fact that he used a beaker from France with that maker's mark from a French silversmith, when there were perfectly good silversmiths in the colonies, this suggests that the beaker also for him represented a continuing tie to France and to the French Huguenot diaspora that he still thought of himself as part of while the designs that he added, of course, show his fervent commitment to Protestantism and the Protestant cause. So in this sense, the beaker in and of itself could be seen to represent a tension, conflicting loyalties of Protestants from France, of these Huguenots, who were still French, but who were not safe in France because of their religion. And Britain, as I said, by this time was the biggest Protestant power. Hanoverian kings of the Hanover dynasty, like George II, who was on the throne in 1750, were seen as protectors of the Protestant world. And their role, the, this role of the British kings as defenders of the Protestant faith, was probably especially important to the Huguenots because they had no particular feeling of attachment to the laws or customs or traditions of England. And many of them probably still thought of themselves as French and as sort of foreigners in exile in the British world, in the British Empire. And it was really just the religious tie that cemented their loyalty and commitment to Britain. And these arguments, I think, are, are underscored by other pieces that have appeared in the historical and scholarly record engraved by Joseph Liddell, which probably formed a set together with this beaker. So what are these other pieces and what makes it seem that it was part of a set of three? Well, there are two other silver vessels also engraved by Liddell and marked 1750, the same year. And these other two have also appeared at different times in museum collections. So the one I'll talk about first is a silver tankard made by a silversmith named William Villant, who worked in Philadelphia in the early 1700s. So this one may have also been obtained or commissioned from somewhere else outside of New York, although we don't know much of anything else that I can find about William Villant. But he made this tankard, so sort of a large lidded mug often used for beer or ale, and Liddell acquired it and, and engraved it in 1750. For a time in the 1920s, this piece was lent to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So one way or another, it ended up back in Britain. And an article published in 1929 describes this tankard, although I haven't been able to find a good picture of it. It's described as being engraved with three figures. So again, this repetition of three, three figures around the rim of the vessel. And one of the figures on this tankard is Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, who had been the chief of Clan Fraser in the Scottish Highlands and who led the Fraser clan to take part in the Jacobite uprising of 1745. So he was known as a sort of notorious leader of this Jacobite rebellion. He was old and had a, a long-standing reputation, so he became sort of a cause celebre after he was arrested, taken prisoner, and sent to London. And in London, he was executed for treason on Tower Hill in 1747. And it happens that he was actually the last person ever to be executed by beheading in England. The other two figures alongside Simon Fraser are the two officers who presided over his trial, namely Philip Lord Hardwick, who was the Lord High Chancellor, and Philip Earl of Chesterfield, the Secretary of State. So it's a little odd. It's a strange juxtaposition, right? Having this Jacobite Scottish chieftain and then the two officers who oversaw his trial and execution. 
but it's clear that this tankard was intended to be celebratory because around the rim, again, there are three verses. And these verses are all Latin proverbs that celebrate the virtues of gallantry, loyalty, and prosperity. And one of them, for instance, is a line taken from a Latin translation of the Odyssey in which Penelope says that she will always be the wife of Ulysses, right? And she's the great symbol of loyalty and constancy. So in this, I think, was probably intended as a jab at Lord Lovett, right? And Lord Lovett, as it happens, his last words were also a Latin proverb. They were the line from the Latin poet Horace, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. And so these verses that Joseph Liddell engraved around this tankard are probably meant as uh, a sort of mocking contrast by celebrating loyalty in contrast to Fraser's treason. And obviously this tankard, like the beaker, shows this continuing theme of antipathy to Jacobitism and loyalty to the Protestant Hanovers. And there is again this repetition of threes, three figures and three adages. And this theme then continues again in a slightly different way on another vessel. So this third one is a silver can, spelled C-A-N-N, which is an old word for a large, round, sort of bulbous mug. And this silver can was made by Bartholomew LaRue II, who was a silversmith in New York. So this is the only one of the three made in New York. And although I couldn't find much of anything about Bartholomew LaRue II, it is clear that he was another colonial New York craftsman of Huguenot extraction, may have been a friend or associate of Liddell. And this large can is especially richly decorated with six biblical scenes from the life of the patriarch Joseph, the son of Jacob. So when one looks around the can, there are actually two registers of engravings, mean, meaning sort of horizontal bands wrapping around, one around the top of the can and one around the bottom. And each register has three scenes engraved in it. And in order, they are Joseph being sold into exile by his brothers, Joseph being seduced and imprisoned, Joseph interpreting the dreams of his fellow prisoners, Joseph then interpreting the Pharaoh's dreams, leading to him being elevated to a high position in Egypt, Joseph being visited and revered by his brothers and family who come to Egypt, and then finally Joseph revealing himself and being reconciled with his family. So these are the scenes once he's arranged, again, three at a time around these registers, around the sides of the can. And in this way, again, it echoes the beaker and the tankard. It seems that this can and the very rich, elaborate engravings on it was probably especially important to Joseph Liddell. His name is Joseph, right? So this is his biblical namesake that he's depicting. And furthermore, the story of Joseph is a story of a man being thrown into exile, but then finding success and security abroad in the service of a foreign ruler. So probably Liddell, and even more than that, the Huguenot community probably took the story of Joseph to sort of represent their story and their experiences using their skill and their wits to secure prosperity in a foreign land under a foreign ruler. So all in all, it seems reasonable to suppose that these three silver drinking vessels, the beaker, the tankard, and the can, might have all been created by Joseph Liddell as a set in 1750 to drink and perhaps to toast on special occasions like Pope's Day. And they might have been in these three different forms for three different beverages, perhaps the tankard for beer, the can for wine, and the beaker for brandy. Okay, so finally, the last question about the history and meaning of this beaker is how did it end up in the Museum of the City of New York? Well, as I said before, it seems as if the estate of Joseph Liddell, who engraved these three vessels, must have been broken up after his death, maybe auctioned off at the time or some years later, because these three vessels who share this common theme and this, and this common date all ended up in three different collections in different cities. 
Now, the Museum of the City of New York has this beaker, and how did it end up there? Well, according to an email from a curator at the museum, the museum bought it in 1976 from someone named Luther Hussey. So who was Luther Hussey? Well, it's impossible to say absolutely for certain because there have been several individuals by that name in the United States over the past hundred years. But based on the dates, if one looks for someone who was maybe getting older, perhaps in retirement, ready to give away or sell valuables from their possessions as of 1976, it seems overwhelmingly likely that the Luther Hussey we're talking about is Luther Newton Hussey, who was born in Indiana in 1899. And we can reconstruct a few facts about this person's life. Sometime before 1935, he migrated from Indiana to Fresno, California. And a lot of people moved west in those years, especially in the Depression years with the agricultural collapse in the Midwest. So he ended up in Fresno, California. And as of 1940, he was living there with his wife, his mother-in-law, and two daughters. After World War II, he relocated to the San Diego area and he became a municipal judge in San Diego. It seems he had a fairly ordinary career in the judiciary, except one highlight perhaps is in 1959, he presided over an extremely rare and unusual hearing when one litigant pled guilty to dueling, which was technically a crime in California, but a lesser crime than murder or manslaughter. So two men in 1959 were in a gunfight, one of them was shot, and the other one tried to plead guilty to dueling, but Judge Hussey tossed out that plea on the grounds that there had been insufficient preliminaries to elevate this sort of street gunfight to the level of a duel. Now, 10 years later, in 1969, he retired from the bench, and sometime after that, he moved back to Fresno, where he died in 1981. So all in all, the timing here seems to make sense. As I said, people often donate or sell valuables in their retirement. So 1976 would make sense as a time when he might have sold this item back to the Museum of the City of New York. But then, of course, the question is, where did Luther Hussey get it from in the first place? And as far as I can see, there is no evidence of him being a collector or of having any particular interest in antiques. And so hence, it makes more sense to suppose that the beaker may have come down in his family. So we have to consider who were Luther Hussey's parents. Well, his father was Charles Hussey, and he was born and lived most of his life in Indiana. Now, Hussey is a fairly common English and Irish name. There is a large Hussey extended family in Indiana, and it seems as if they migrated at some point earlier from Ohio, and the name has Quaker roots and associations. As far as I could see, there is no evident connection of Charles Hussey or his family to New York. Now, then as for Luther Hussey's mother, his mother was named Pearl M. Rarick. R-A-R-I-C-K. Now, Rarick is a somewhat less common name, and it's distinct to the United States because it's an Americanized version of an originally German name, Rurich, R-O-H-R-I-C-H. -H. And so this name Rarick is most common in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, basically places of early German settlement in America. And a very early occurrence, the earliest occurrence that I saw of this name Rarick, is that it was used by a German Reformed Protestant family that belonged to the Galatin Church. And that is a colonial Dutch Reformed Protestant church in the Hudson Valley, north of Poughkeepsie. So this Galatin Church was somewhat typical of many Dutch Reformed churches around New York and New Jersey in the sense that it had been founded and was affiliated to the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, but it also had many worshippers who joined in who were of German and French heritage and who had similar Reformed Calvinist beliefs. In this way, the Galatin Church can be seen as similar or even representative of what was going on in colonial New York in the mid-1700s, where the Dutch Reformed Church was really no longer mainly Dutch. It was actually a melting pot 
bringing together people of different nationalities and languages united by their Calvinist beliefs and practices. So I have not been able to trace precisely the ancestry of Pearl Rarick and whether or not her family may go back to New York or to the Gallatin Church or somewhere else in New York. But it does seem very possible that what happened is that this beaker was passed from Liddell, from Joseph Liddell after his death, to friends and associates in the Dutch Reformed Church in New York, who would have shared similar sensibilities, right? Similar commitments to Reformed Protestantism, to Britain, and to antipathy and fear of Jacobitism and the Stuarts. And from there, it passed at some point into the Rarick family and traveled with that family as they migrated west, all the way from New York to Indiana, and then ultimately all the way to California, before it then returned back to New York in 1976. So hence, there's a lot of social and political meaning to not only the object itself, but also to its provenance and its history. It reflects this heritage of colonial New York, specifically the strongly Calvinist society that was built there first by the Dutch and then by German and French migrants and refugees who joined them, who were united by religious convictions, commitment to the Hanovers, and antipathy to Jacobitism. And this is really ironic when you put this in perspective. It's ironic because the Jacobite movement only began because of the overthrow and exile of the king James II, who was a Catholic king who was ousted by Parliament and by William of Orange and who then fled the country and took his Stuart family into exile on the continent. So James II and his heirs and successors, including Prince Charles, were the great enemies, the great villains in the view of this fervent Calvinist world. But it was the same James who was known as James II on the throne that same James, before he became king, was known as Duke of York. And in that position as Duke of York, he took up governance of the colony of New Netherlands after it was taken over by England. He renamed it New York. That's why it's York in honor of the Duke of York. And he instituted religious toleration in the colony. And hence, he allowed for the Dutch Reformed Church to continue on and to grow under English and British rule. And this also allowed the colony of New York to welcome in new migrants through the years, including French Huguenots. And so there's a great irony here that the very same religious toleration instituted by James allowed for the coalescing of a new society in New York, defined in large part by Calvinism and by violent antipathy towards him and his heirs and successors. So it shows you the sort of strange vicissitudes of British and British colonial politics in the 1700s. Thank you.